Hi, I'm Christopher Scott, and welcome to the Joel Siegel Great Works Reading Series. I'm the director of today's presentation of The Othello Project. Um, normally, we would be presenting this to you live in a theatrical setting with the actors, scripts in hands, uh, creating the play in front of you, giving it life as we would towards a full production. Uh, but today in our social distanced world, we are going to be presenting this virtually, which means that this uh, entire product has been rehearsed and recorded on Zoom. Yay, Zoom! <laughs> anyway, so um, we work on a very quick schedule. We rehearse for about a total of 16 hours over a four-day period, and then we would present it or record it. Um, normally, a professional production rehearses for about four weeks, eight hours a day, and then we add costume sets, lights, um, choreograph fights, even stage blood if necessary. All that would help to bring Shakespeare's tragic tale of revenge to life. Well, as you all know, a play, this play, Othello, that you are reading for class and you should have read or are reading and is why you are here is just a blueprint. Um, a blueprint of what the playwright has intended for the actors and the directors to create. Uh, they start out as words on a page and uh, we turn it into a living, breathing thing. I mean, sure, plays can be read, as you know, and uh, you utilize your imagination, but they are meant to be seen. In fact, the Greek word for theater, theatron, literally translated means the seeing place. The place where we go to see ourselves. So the Othello Project. Um, we will today be focusing on a particular intimate portion of Othello, which I have called the handkerchief edit. Um, this is where we are going to watch Iago weave his web of deceit around everybody, utilizing Desdemona's stolen handkerchief. Othello usually runs uh, about three and a half hours. What you're going to see today is about 90 minutes. And um, right after that, there is a brief virtual talk back with the artists that you are seeing, uh, reflecting on their experience of the play. So, right now, I ask you, to give yourself over to the incredible words of Shakespeare as we offer to you our presentation of Othello. Thank you for being here and enjoy. The intrigue starts in Venice. The ensign Iago plots to destroy his general, the Moor, Othello, after being passed over for promotion in favor of the younger and charismatic Cassio. Othello's marriage to the noble Desdemona has caused much scandal in Venice, and Iago plots with Rodrigo, a fellow soldier in love with Desdemona, to take down Othello and Cassio. After being commanded to lead the Venetian troops against the Turks at Cyprus, Othello and Train leave for the island where Iago gets the honorable but naive Cassio, who has trouble holding his liquor, drunk, and sets him up for an ungentlemanly brawl. The result which ends with Cassio being stripped of his rank by Othello. Iago in his craftiness persuades the crestfallen Cassio to reach out to Desdemona in order to appeal to the general and makes the net that shall enmesh them all. And what's he then that says I play the villain? When this advice is free, I give and honest, probable to thinking, and indeed the course to win the more again. How am I then a villain 
to counsel Cassio to this parallel course directly to his good. For whilst this honest fool plies Desdemona to repair his fortunes, and she for him pleads strongly to the moor, I'll pour this pestilence into his ear, that she repeals him for his body's lust. Two things are to be done. My wife must move for Cassio to her mistress. I'll set her on, myself the while to draw the moor apart, and bring him jump when he make Cassio find soliciting his wife. Aye, that's the way. Dull not device by coldness and delay. Be thou assured, good Cassio, I will do all my abilities in thy behalf. Good madam, do, I warrant. It grieves my husband as if the case were his. Ah, oh, that's an honest fellow. Do not doubt, Cassio, but I will have my lord and you again as friendly as you were. Bounteous, madam, whatever shall become of Michael Cassio, he's never anything but your true servant. I know it. I thank you. You do love my lord. You have known him long. And be you well assured, he shall in strangeness stand no further off than in a polite distance. Ay, but lady, that policy may either last so long, or feed upon such nice and waterish diet, or breed itself so out of circumstance, that I, being absent and my place supplied, my general will forget my love and service. Do not doubt that. Before Amelia here, I give thee warrant of thy place, assure thee. If I do vow a friendship, I'll perform it to the last article. My lord shall never rest. I'll watch him tame and talk him out of patience. His bed shall seem a school, his board a shrift. I'll, inter I'll intermingle everything he does with Cassio's suit. Therefore be merry, good Cassio, for thy solicitor shall rather die than give thy cause away. Madam, here comes my lord. Madam, I'll take my leave. Why stay, and hear me speak? Madam, not now. I am very ill at ease, unfit for mine own purposes. Well, do your discretion. Pa, oh, I like not that. What dost thou say? Nothing, my lord, or if I know not what. Was not that Cassio parted from my wife? Cassio, my lord? No, sure, I cannot think it, that he would steal away so guilty-like, seeing you coming. I do believe t'was he. Thou now, my lord, I have been talking with a suitor here, a man that languishes in your displeasure. Who is't you mean? Why, your Lieutenant Cassio. Good, my lord, if I have any grace or power to move you, his present reconciliation take. For if he be not one who truly loves you, I have no judgment in an honest face. I pray you, call him back. Went he hence now? I sooth, so humbled that he hath left part of his grief here with me to suffer with him. Good, my love, call him back. And not now, sweet Desdemona, some other time. Well, shall it be shortly? The sooner sweet for you. Shall it be tonight at supper? No, not tonight. Tomorrow dinner, then? I shall not dine at home. I meet the captains at the Citadel. Why, then, tomorrow night, or Tuesday morn, or Tuesday noon, or night, or Wednesday morn? I prithee, name the time, but let it not exceed three days. In faith, he's penitent. When shall he come? Tell me, Othello, I wonder in my soul what you would ask me that I should deny or stand so mammering on. What? Michael Cassio, who, who came a-wooing with you, and so many a time when I have spoken of you dispraisingly, hath ta'en your part. To have so much to do to bring him in? Trust me, I could do much. Prithee no more. Let him come when he will. I will deny thee nothing. Well, this is not a boon. 
Tis as I should entreat you, wear your gloves, or feed on nourishing dishes, or keep you warm, or sue to you to do a peculiar profit to your own person. Nay, when I have a suit wherein I mean to touch your love indeed, it shall be full of poise and difficult weight and fearful to be granted. I will deny thee nothing. Whereon I do beseech thee grant me this, to leave me but a little to myself. Shall I deny you? No. Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, my Desdemona. I'll come to thee straight. Amelia, come. Be as your fancies teach you. Whate'er you be, I am obedient. Excellent wretch. Perdition catch my soul, but I do love thee. And when I love thee not, chaos is come again. My noble lord. What dost thou say, Iago? Did Michael Cassio, when you wooed, my lady, know of your love? He did, from first to last. Why dost thou ask? But for a satisfaction of my thought. No further, huh? Why of thy thought, Iago? I did not think he had been acquainted with her. Oh, yes, and went between us very oft. Indeed. Indeed. Aye, indeed, discernst thou aught in that? Is he not honest? Honest, my lord. Honest, aye, honest. My lord, for aught I know. What dost thou think? Think, my lord. Think, my lord. By heaven he echoes me, as if there were some monster in his thought, too hideous to be shown. Thou dost mean something, and when I told thee he was of my counsel, in my whole course of wooing thou criest indeed, and didst contract and purse thy brow together, as if thou hadst shut up in thy brain some horrible conceit. If thou dost love me, Show me thy thought. My lord, you know I love you. Yeah, I think thou dost. For Michael Cassio, I dare be sworn I think that he is honest. I think so, too. Men should be what they seem, or those that be not, would they might see none. Certain men should be what they seem. Why, then, I think Cassio's an honest man. Nay, yet there's more in this. I prithee, speak to me as to thy thinkings, as thou dost ruminate, and, and give thy thoughts the worst of thoughts, the worst of words. Could my lord pardon me? Though I am bound to every act of duty, I am not bound to that all slaves are free to. Utter my thoughts. I say they are vile and false, as was that palace whereinto foul things sometimes intrude not. Thou dost conspire against thy friend, Iago. If thou but think'st him wronged, and makest his ear a stranger to thy thoughts. I do beseech you, though I perchance am vicious in my guess, as I confess it is my nature's plague to spy into abuses, and oft my jealousy shapes faults that are not. More for my manhood, honesty, or wisdom, to let you know my thoughts. What dost thou mean? Good name, in man and woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their souls. Who steals my purse, steals trash. Tis something, nothing, t'was mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name, robs me of that which not enriches him, and makes me poor indeed. By heaven, I'll know thy thoughts. You cannot. If my heart were in your hand, nor shall not, whilst tis in my custody. Ha! <laughs> oh, beware, my lord of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. The cuckold lives in bliss, who, certain of his fate, loves not his wronger. But, oh, what damned minutes tells he o'er, who dotes, yet doubts, suspects, yet strongly loves. Oh, misery! Poor and content is rich, and rich enough, 
but rich is fineness, is as poor as winter, to him that ever fears that he shall be poor. Good heaven, the souls of all my tribe defend from jealousy. Why, why is this? Think'st thou I'd make a life of jealousy? To follow still the changes of the moon with fresh suspicions? No! To be once in doubt is once to be resolved. Exchange me for a goat when I shall turn the business of my soul to such exsufflicate and blown surmises matching thy inference. <laughs> Tis not to make me jealous to say my wife is fair, feeds well, loves company, is free of speech, sings, plays, and dances well, where virtue is, these are more virtuous, nor from mine own weak merits will I draw the smallest fear or doubt of her revolt. For she had eyes, and chose me. No, Iago, I'll see before I doubt. When I doubt, prove, and on the proof there is no more but this. Away at once with love or jealousy. I am glad of it. For now I shall have reason to show the love and duty that I bear you with franker spirit. Therefore, as I am bound, receive it from me. I speak not yet of proof. Look to your wife. Observe her well with Cassio. Wear your eye thus, not jealous nor secure. I would not have your free and noble nature out of self-bounty be abused. Look to it. I know our country disposition well. In Venice they do let heaven see the pranks they dare not show their husbands. Their best conscience is not to leave undone, but to keep unknown. Dost thou say so? She did deceive her father, Mary knew. And when she seemed to shake and fear your looks, she loved them most. And so she did. I go to then. She that, so young, could give out such a seeming to seal her father's eye up close as oak, he thought was witchcraft. <laughs> but I am much to blame. I humbly do beseech you of your pardon for too much loving you. I am bound to thee forever. I see this hath a little dashed your spirit. Not a jot. Not a jot. In faith, I fear it has. I hope you will consider what is spoke comes from my love. But I do see you're moved. I am to pray you not to strain my speech to grosser issues, nor to larger reach than to suspicion. I will not. Should you do so, my lord, my speech which should fall into such vile success as my thoughts aim not at. Cassio's my worthy friend. My lord, I see you're moved. No, not much moved. I do not think but Desdemona's honest. Long live she so, and long live you to think so. And yet, how nature erring from itself. Aye, there's the point, as to be bold with you, not to affect many proposed matches of her own clime complexion and degree, whereto we see in all things nature tends. Oh, one may smell in such a will most rank, foul disproportion, thoughts unnatural. But pardon me, I do not in position distinctly speak of her, though I may fear her will, recoiling to her better judgment, may fall to match you with her Country forms, and happily repent. Farewell. Farewell. If more thou dost perceive, let me know more. Set on thy wife to observe. Leave me, Iago. My lord, I would I might entreat your honor to scan this thing no further. Leave it to time. Though it be fit that Cassio have his place, for sure he fills it up with great ability. Yet, if you please, to hold him off a while, you shall by that perceive him and his means. Note, 
If your lady strain his entertainment with any strong or vehement importunity, much will be seen in that. In the meantime, let me be thought too busy in my fears, as worthy cause I have to fear I am, and hold her free. I do beseech your honor. Fear not my government. I once more take my leave. This fellow's of exceeding honesty, and knows all qualities with a learned spirit of human dealings. If I do prove her haggard, though her, that her jessies were my dear heartstrings, I'd whistle her off and let her down the wind to pray at fortune. Happily, for I am black and have not those soft parts of converse, conversation that chambers have, or for I am declined into the veil of years, yet th that's not much. She's gone. <sighs> I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. Ah! Curse of marriage, that we can call these delicate creatures ours and not their appetites. I had rather be a toad and live upon the vapor of a dungeon than keep a corner in the thing I love. For others' uses. Desdemona comes. If she be false, oh, then heaven mocks itself. I'll not believe it. How now, my dear Othello? Your dinner and the generous islanders by you invited do attend your presence. I am to blame. Why do you speak so faintly? Are you not well? I have a pain upon my forehead here. Faith, that's with watching. Twill away again. Let me but bind it hard within this hour. It will be well. Your napkin is too little. Let it alone. Uh, come, I'll go with you. I'm very sorry that you're not well. I am glad I have found this napkin. This, this was her first remembrance from the moor. My wayward husband hath a hundred times wooed me to steal it, but she so loves the token. For he conjured her she should ever keep it, that she reserves it evermore about her to kiss and to talk to. I'll have the work taken out and give it to Iago. What he'll do with it, heaven knows, not I. I nothing but to please his fantasy. How now? What do you hear alone? Do not you chide. I have a thing for you. A thing for me? It is a common thing. <laughs> to have a foolish wife. Oh, is that all? What will you give me now for the same handkerchief? What handkerchief? What handkerchief? Why, that the more first gave to Desdemona. That which so often you did bid me to steal? I stolen it from her. No, Faith, she let it drop by negligence, and to the advantage, I, being here, took it up. Look, here it is. A good wench. Give it me. Uh, no, what will you do with it that you've been so earnest to have me felt it? Why, what's that to you? If it be not for some purpose of import, give it to me again. Poor lady, she shall run mad when she'll lack it. Be not it known on it. I have use for it. Go. Leave me. I will, in Cassio's lodging, lose this napkin and let him find it. Trifles, light as air, are to the jealous confirmations strong as proofs of holy writ. This may do something. The moor already changes with my poison. Look where he comes. Not poppy, nor mandragora, nor all the drowsy syrups of the world shall e'er medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou owedst yesterday. Ha! Ha! False to me! 
Well, how now, General? No more of that. Villain! Be sure thou prove my love a whore. Be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof, or by the worth of man's eternal soul, thou hadst better have been born a dog than answer my waked wrath. Make me to seat, or at least so prove it, that the probation bear no hinge nor loop to hang a doubt on, or woe upon thy life! My noble lord! Thou dost slander her and torture me, never pray more! Abandon all remorse on horror's head, horrors accumulate. Do deeds to make heaven weep, all earth amazed, for nothing canst thou to damnation add greater than that. Oh, grace. Oh, heaven forgive me. Are you a man? Have you a soul or sense? Avaunt! Be gone! Thou hast set me on the rack. I think my wife be honest and think she is not. I think that thou art just, and think thou art not. I found not Cassio's kisses on her lips. I'll have some proof. Her name, that was as fresh as Diane's visage, is now begrimed and black as mine own face. If there be cords or knives, poison or fire, or suffocating streams, I'll not endure it. Would I were satisfied. I see, sir, you are eaten up with passion. I do repent me that I put it to you. You would be satisfied. Would? Nay, I will. And may. But how? How satisfied, my lord, would you, the supervisor, grossly gape on, behold her talked? Death and damnation! Oh! It were a tedious difficulty, I think, to bring them to that prospect, then. Damn them, then, if ever mortal eyes do see them bolster more than their own. What, then? How, then? What shall I say? It is impossible you should see this, were they as prime as goats, as hot as monkeys, as salt as wolves in pride, and fools as gross as ignorance made drunk. But yet I say, if imputation and strong circumstances, which lead directly to the door of truth, will give you satisfaction, you may have to. Give me a living reason she's disloyal. I do not like the office. But sith I am entered in this cause so far, pricked to it by foolish honesty and love, I will go on. I lay with Cassio lately, and being troubled with a raging tooth, I could not sleep. There are a kind of men so loose of soul that in their sleeps will mutter their affairs. Such a one of this kind is Cassio. In sleep I heard him say, Sweet Desdemona, let us be wary, let us hide our loves, and then, sir, he would grip and wring my hand, cry, Oh, sweet creature, then kiss me hard, as if he plucked up kisses by the roots that grew upon my lips, and then laid his leg over my thigh, and sighed, and kissed, and then cried, Cursed fate that gave thee to the moor. Nay! This was but his dream! But this denoted a foregone conclusion, and this may help to thicken other proofs that do demonstrate thinly. Tell me but this. Have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberry in your wife's hand? I gave her such a one. T'was my first gift. I know not that, but such a handkerchief. I am sure it was your wife's. Did I today see Cassio wipe his beard with? If it be that... If it be that, or any that was hers, it speaks against her with the other proofs. Cassio! 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 Oh, that the slave had forty thousand lives! One is too poor, too weak for my revenge! Arise, black vengeance from the hollow cell! Oh, blood, 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 yield up! Oh, love, 
Thy crown and hearted throne to tyrannous hate, swell bosom with thy fraught, for tis of aspic's tongues. Patience, I say, your mind perhaps may change. Never, Iago. My bloody thoughts with violent pace shall ne'er look back, ne'er ebb to humble love, till that a capable and wide revenge swallow them up. Now, by yon marble heaven, in the due reverence of a sacred vow, I here engage my words. Do not rise yet. Witness, you ever-burning lights above, you elements that clip us round about, witness that here Iago doth give up the execution of his wit, hands, heart, to wrong it a fellow's service. Let him command, and to obey shall be in me remorse what bloody business ever. I greet thy love, not with vain thanks, but with acceptance bounteous, and will upon the instant put thee to it. Within these three days let me hear thee say that Cassio's not alive. My friend is dead. Tis done at your request, but let her live. Damn her, lewd minx! Oh, damn her! Come, go with me apart. I will withdraw to furnish me with some swift means of death for the fair devil. Now art thou my lieutenant. I am your own forever. Where should I lose that handkerchief, Amelia? I know not, madam. Believe me, I had rather have lost my purse full of crusados, and, but my noble more is true of mind, and made of no such baseness as jealous creatures are, it were enough to put him to ill thinking. Oh, uh, is he not jealous? Who, he? I think the son where he was born drew all such humors from him. <laughs> Look where he comes. I will not leave him now till Cassio be called to him. How is with you, my lord? Well, my good lady, hardness to dissemble. How do you, Desdemona? Well, my good lord. Give me your hand. This hand is moist, my lady. It yet hath felt no age, nor known no sorrow. This argues fruitfulness in a liberal heart. Hot, hot and moist. This hand of yours requires a sequester from liberty, fasting and prayer, much castigation, exercise devout. For here's a young and sweating devil here that commonly rebels. Tis a good hand, a frank one. You may indeed say so, for t'was that hand that gave away my heart. A liberal hand. <laughs> I cannot speak of this. Come, your promise. What promise, Chuck? I have sent Cassio to come speak with you. I have a salt and sorry room offends me. Lend me thy handkerchief. Here, my lord. That which I gave you. I have it not about me. Not? No, indeed, my lord. That is a fault. That handkerchief did an Egyptian to my mother give. She was a charmer and could almost read the thoughts of people. She told her while she kept it would make her amiable and subdue my father entirely to her love. But if she lost it or made a gift of it, my father's eyes should hold her loathed and his spirit should hunt after new fancies. She, dying, gave it me, and bid me, when my fate would have me wive, to give it her. I did so, 
and take heed on it. Make it a darling like your precious eye. To lose it or give it way were such perdition as nothing else could match. It's possible. Tis true. There's magic in the web of it. A sibyl that had numbered in the world the sun to course two hundred compasses in her prophetic fury sewed the work. The worms were hollowed that did breed the silk, and it was dyed in mummy which the skillful conserved of maidens' hearts. Indeed, is true? Most veritable. Therefore look to it well. And would to God that I had never seen it. Ha! Wherefore? Why do you speak so startlingly and rash? Ist lost? Ist gone? Speak! Is it out of the way? Heaven bless us. Hey, you? It is not lost. But what in if it were? How? I say it is not lost. Fetch it. Let me see it. Why, so I can, sir, but I will not now. This is a trick to put me from my suit. Pray you, let Cassio be received again. Fetch me the handkerchief. My mind misgives. Come, come. You'll never meet a more sufficient man. The handkerchief! I pray, talk me of Cassio. The handkerchief! A man that all his time hath founded his good fortunes on your love, shared dangers with you. The handkerchief! In sooth, you are to blame. Away! Is this man not jealous? I ne'er saw this before. Sure, there's some wonder in this handkerchief. I am most unhappy in the loss of it. It is not a year or two shows us a man. They are all but stomachs, and we all but food to eat us hungrily, and when they are full, they belch us. Look you, Cassio and my husband. There is no other way. To she must do it. And lo, the happiness. Go and importune her. How now, good Cassio? What is the news with you? Madam, my former suit, I do beseech you that by your virtuous means I may again exist and be a member of his love whom I, with all the office of my heart, entirely honor. I would not be delayed. If my offense be of such mortal kind, that nor my service past, nor present sorrows, nor proposed merit in futurity can ransom me into his love again, but to know so must be my benefit. So shall I clothe me in a forced content, and shut myself up in some other course to fortune's alms. Alas, thrice gentle Cassio, my advocation is not now in tune. My lord is not my lord, nor should I know him were he in favor as in humor altered. So help me every spirit sanctified as I have spoken for you all my best and stood within the blank of his displeasure for my free speech. You must a while be patient. What I can do, I will, and more I will than for myself I dare. Let that suffice you. Is my lord angry? He went hence but now, and certainly in strange unquietness. Can he be angry? I have seen the cannon when it hath blown his ranks into the air, and like the devil from his very arm puffed his own brother. And can he be angry? Something of the moment, then. I will go meet him. There's matter in it indeed if he be angry. I pray thee do so. Something sure of state, either from Venice or some unhatched practice made demonstrable here in Cyprus to him, hath puddled his clear spirit. And in such cases, men's natures wrangle with inferior things, though great ones are their object. Tis even so. For let our finger ache and it induce our other healthful members even to that sense of pain. Nay, we must think men are not gods, nor of them look for such observances as fit the bridal. Beshrew me much, Amelia. I was an handsome warrior as I am, arraigning his unkindness with my soul, but now I find I had suborned the witness and he's indicted falsely. 
Pray heaven it be state matters as you think, and no conception nor jealous toy concerning you. Alas, the day I never gave him cause. Yeah, but jealous souls will not be answered so. They are not ever jealous for the cause, but jealous for they are jealous. Tis a monster begot upon itself, born on itself. Heaven keep that monster from Othello's mind. Lady, amen. I will go seek him. Cassio, walk hereabout. If I do find him fit, I will move your suit and seek to effect it to my uttermost. I humbly thank your ladyship. Oh. Save you, friend Cassio. What make you from home? How is it with you, my most fair Bianca? In faith, sweet love, I was coming to your house. Hmm. And I was going to your lodging, Cassio. What? Keep a week away? Seven days and nights? Eight score, eight hours? And lovers absent hours more tedious than the dial eight score times? A weary reckoning. Pardon me, Bianca. I have this while with leaden thoughts been pressed, but I shall, in a more continuate time, strike off this score of absence. Sweet Bianca, take me this work out. Oh, Cassio, whence came this? This is some token from a newer friend. I felt absence, now I feel a cause. It's come to this? Well, well. Go to, woman. Throw your vile guesses in the devil's teeth from whence you have them. You are jealous now that this is from some mistress, some remembrance. No, in good troth, Bianca. Why? Whose is it? I know not, sweet. I found it in my chamber. I like the work well. Ere it be demanded, as like enough it will, I'd have it copied. Take it and do it, and leave me for this time. Leave you? Wherefore? I do attend here on the general, and think it no addition, nor my wish to have him see me womaned. Why, I pray you? Not that I love you not. <laughs> but that you do not love me. I pray you. Bring me on the way a little, and say if I shall see you soon at night. Tis but a little way that I can bring you, for I attend here, but I'll see you soon. Mm, tis very good. I must be circumstanced. Will you think so? Think so, Iago. What? To kiss in private? An unauthorized kiss. Or to be naked with a friend in bed an hour or more, not meaning any harm. Naked in bed, Iago, and not mean harm. It is hypocrisy against the devil. They that mean virtuously and yet do so, the devil their virtues tempts, and they tempt heaven. So they do nothing. Tis a venial slip. But if I give my wife a handkerchief... What then? Why then, tis hers, my lord. And being hers, she may, I think, bestow it on any man. She is protectress of her honor, too. May she give that? Her honor is an essence that's not seen. They have it very oft that have it not. But for the handkerchief... By heaven! I would most gladly have forgot it. Thou saidst it comes o'er my memory, as doth the raven o'er the infected house, boding to all. He had my handkerchief! Aye, what of that? That's not so good now. What if I had said 
I had seen him do you wrong, or heard him say, as knaves be such abroad. Hath he said anything? He hath, my lord. But be you well assured, no more than he'll unswear. What hath he said? Faith that he did. I know not what he did. What? What? Lie. With her? With her. On her. What you will. Lie with her. Lie on her. We say lie on her when they belie her. Lie with her, that's fulsome. Handkerchief, confessions, handkerchief. To confess and be hanged for his labor. First to be hanged and then to confess. I, I tremble at it. Nature would not invest herself in such shadowing passion without some instruction. It is not words that shake me thus. She, she, she noses, ears, and lips. Is it possible? Confess? Handkerchief. Oh, devil. Work on, my medicine. Work. Thus credulous fools are caught, and many worthy and chaste dames, even thus all guiltless meet reproach. What ho, my lord! My lord, I say, Othello! How now, Cassio? What's the matter? My lord is fallen into an epilepsy. This is his second fit. He had one yesterday. Rub him about the temples. No, forbear. The lethargy must have his quiet course. If not, he foams at mouth and by and by breaks out to savage madness. Look where he stirs. Do you withdraw yourself a little while? He will recover straight. When he is gone, I would on great occasion speak with you. How is it, General? Have you not hurt your head? Did he confess it? Good sir, be a man. Think every bearded fellow this but yoke may draw with you? Stand you a while apart. Confine yourself in a patient list. Whilst you were here overwhelmed with your grief, a passion most unsuiting such a man, Cassio came hither. I shifted him away and laid good excuse upon your ecstasy. Bade him anon return and here speak with me, the which he promised. Do but encave yourself and mark the fleers, the jibes and notable scorns that dwell in every region of his face. For I will make him tell the tale anew. Where? How? How oft? How long ago, and when he hath, and is again to cope your wife? I say, but mark his gesture. Merry patience, or I shall say you are all in all in spleen, and nothing of a man. Dost thou hear, Iago? I will be found most cunning in my patience. But dost thou hear most Bloody. That's not a miss, but yet keep time and all. Will you withdraw? Now will I cast question Cassio of Bianca, a housewife that by selling her desires buys herself bread and clothes. It is a creature that dotes on Cassio, as tis the strumpet's plague to beguile many and be beguiled by one. He when he hears of her, cannot refrain from the excess of laughter. Here he comes, as he shall smile, a fellow shall go mad. How do you now, Lieutenant? The worser that you give me the addition whose want even kills me. Ply Desdemona well, and you are sure on it. Now, if the suit lay in Bianca's power, how quickly you should speed. Alas, poor caitiff. Look how he laughs already. I never knew woman love man so. Alas, poor rogue. I think in faith she loves me. Uh, now he denies it faintly and laughs it out. Do you hear, Cassio? Now he importunes him to tell it or go to. Well said, well said. She gives it out that you shall marry her. Do you intend it? <laughs> 
Oh, do you triumph, Roman? Do you triumph? I marry her? What a customer. Prithee, bear some charity to my wit. Do not think it so unwholesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so. Ah, they laugh that win. The faith, the faith of cry goes that you shall marry her. Prithee, say true. I am a very villain else. Have you scored me? Well. This is the monkey's own giving out. She is persuaded I will marry her, out of her own love and flattery, not out of my promise. Now he begins the story. She was here, even now. She haunts me in every place. I was the other day, talking on the sea bank with certain Venetians, and thither comes the bauble, and by this hand she falls me thus about my neck, so hangs and lulls and weeps upon me, so hakes and pulls me. <laughs> Crying, oh dear Cassio, as it were his gesture imports it. Now he tells how she plucked him to her chamber. Oh, I see that nose of yours, but not the dog that I shall throw it to. Well, I must leave her company. Before me, look where she comes. Oh, Tis such another fit you, Mary, a perfumed one. Ah! Uh. What do you mean by this haunting of me? Let the devil and his damn haunt you. What did you mean by that same handkerchief you gave me even now? I was a fine fool to take it. I must take out the work. A likely piece of work that you should find it in your chamber and not know who left it there. This is some minx's token and I must take out the work. There, Ooh. give it to your hobby horse wheresoever you had it. I'll take out no work on it. How now, my sweet Bianca? How now? How now? By heaven, that should be my handkerchief. And you'll come to supper tonight, you may. And you will not come when you are next prepared for. After her, after her. Faith, I must. She'll rail in the street else. Will you sup there? Faith, I intend so. Well, I may chance to see you, for I would very fain speak with you. Prithee, come, will you? Go to, say no more. How shall I murder him, Iago? Did you perceive how he laughed at his vice? Oh, Iago! And did you see the handkerchief? Was that mine? Yours, by this hand. And to see how he prizes the foolish woman, your wife. She gave it him, and he hath given it his whore. I would have him nine years of killing a fine woman, a fair woman, a sweet woman. Nay, hey, you must forget that. I let her rot and perish and be damned tonight, for she shall not live. No! My heart is turned to stone, I strike it and it hurts my hand. Oh, the world hath not a sweeter creature. She might lie by an emperor's side and command him tasks. Nay, that's not your way. Hang her! I do but say what she is. So delicate with her needle, an admirable musician. Oh, she will sing the savageness out of a bear of so high and plenteous wit and invention. She's the worse for all this. A thousand, thousand times, and then of so gentle a condition. Aye, too gentle. Nay, that's certain, but yet the pity of it, Iago. Oh, Iago, the pity of it, Iago. If you are so fond over her iniquity, give her patent to offend. For if it touches not you, it comes near nobody. I will chop her to messes, cuckold me. Oh, tis foul in her. With mine officer. That's fouler. Come, get me some poison, Iago. This night, I'll not expostulate with her, lest her body and beauty unprovide my mind again. This night, Iago. Do it not with poison. Strangle her in her bed, even the bed she hath contaminated. Good, good. The justice of it pleases, very good. And for Cassio, let me be his undertaker. You shall hear more by midnight. Excellent good. What trumpet is this same? Something from Venice, sure. Tis Lodovico, come from the Duke, and see, your wife is with him. Save you, worthy general. With all my heart, sir. 
The Duke and Senators of Venice greet you. I kiss the instrument of their pleasures. What's the news, good cousin Ludovico? I am very glad to see you, Signor. Welcome to Cyprus. I thank you. How does Lieutenant Cassio? Lives, sir. Cousin, there's fallen between him and my lord an unkind breach, but you shall make all well. Are you sure of that? My lord? This fall you not to do as you will. He did not call. He's busy in the paper. Is there a division twixt my lord and Cassio? A most unhappy one. I would do much to atone them for the love I bear to Cassio. Fire and brimstone! My lord? Are you wise? Is he angry? Maybe the letter moved him, for, as I think, they do command him home, deputing Cassio in his government. Oh, trust me, I am glad, aunt. Indeed! My lord! I am glad to see you mad. Why, sweet Othello! Devil! I have not deserved this. My lord, this would not be believed in Venice, though I should swear I saw it. Tis very much. Make her amends. She weeps. Oh, devil. Devil. If that earth could teem with women's tears. Each drop she falls would be a crocodile. Out of my sight! I will not stay to offend you. Truly an obedient lady, I do beseech your lordship, call her back. Mistress! My lord? What would you with her, sir? Who, I, my lord? I, you did wish that I would make her turn. She can turn, and turn, and yet go on and turn again. And she can weep, sir, weep. And she's obedient, as you say, obedient, very obedient. Obedient, proceed you in your tears. Concerning this, sir, oh well-painted passion, I am commanded home. Get you away. I'll send for you anon. Sir, I obey the mandate and will return to Venice. Hence, avant! Cassio shall have my place. And, sir, tonight... I do entreat that we may sup together. You are welcome, sir, to Cyprus. Goats and monkeys! Is this the noble moor whom our full senate call all in all sufficient? Is this the nature whose passion could not shake, whose solid virtue the shot of accident nor dart of chance could neither graze nor pierce? He is much changed. Are his wits safe? Is he not light of brain? He's that he is. I may not breathe my censure what he might be. If what he might, he is not, I would to heaven he were. What? Strike his wife? Faith, that was not so well. It would, I knew, that stroke would prove the worst. Is it his use? Or did the letters work upon his blood and new create this fault? Alas, alas. It is not honesty in me to speak what I have seen and known. You shall observe him, and his own courses will denote him so that I may save my speech. Do but go after, and mark how he continues. I am sorry that I am deceived in him. seen nothing then nor ever heard nor ever did suspect yes you have seen cassio and she together but then i saw no harm and then i heard each syllable that breath made up between them what did they never whisper never my lord nor send you out of the way never to fetch her fan her gloves her mask nor nothing never my lord Tis strange. 
I durst, my lord, to wager she is honest. Lay down my soul at stake. If you think other, remove your thought. It doth abuse your bosom. If any wretch hath put this in your head, let heaven requite it with the serpent's curse. For if she be not honest, chaste, and true, there's no man happy. The purest of his wives is foul as slander. Bid her come hither. Go! She says enough, yet she's a simple bawd that cannot say as much. This is a subtle whore, a closet lock and key of villainous secrets, and yet she'll kneel and pray. I've seen her do it. My lord, what is your will? Pray, Chuck, come hither. What is your pleasure? Let me see your eyes. Look in my face. What horrible fancy is this? Some of your function, mistress. Leave procreants alone and shut the door. Cough or cry hem if anybody come. Your mystery. Your mystery. Nay, dispatch. Upon my knees, what doth your speech import? I understand a fury in your words, but not the words. Why? What art thou? Your wife, my lord, your true and loyal wife. Come, swear it. Damn thyself, lest being like one of heaven, the devils themselves should fear to seize thee. Therefore be double damned. Swear thou art honest. Heaven doth truly know it. Heaven truly knows that thou art false as hell. To whom, my lord, with whom? How am I false? O oh, Desdemona, away, away, away! Alas, the heavy day, why do you weep? Am I the motive of these tears, my lord? If haply you, my father, do suspect an instrument of this you're calling back, lay not your blame on me. If you have lost him, why, I have lost him too. Had it pleased heaven to try me with affliction that they had rained all kinds of sores and shames on my bare head, steeped me in poverty to the very lips, given to captivity me and my utmost hopes, I should have found in some place of my soul a drop of patience. But, alas, to make me a fixed figure for the time of scorn to point his slow, unmoving finger at. Yet could I bear that too? Well, very well. But there, where I have garnered up my heart, where either I must live or bear no life, the fountain from the which my current runs or else dries up, to be discarded thence, or keep it as a cistern for foul toads to not engender in. Turn thy complexion there, patience. Thou young and rose-lipped cherubim, I there look grim as hell. I hope my noble lord esteems me honest. Oh, I as summer flies are in the shambles that quicken even with the blowing. O oh, thou weed, who art so lovely fair and smellst so sweet, that the sense aches at thee, would thou hadst ne'er been born. Alas, what ignorant sin have I committed? Was this fair paper, this most goodly book, made to write whore upon? What? Committed, committed. Oh, thou public commoner, I should make very forges of my cheeks that would to cinders burn up modesty did I but speak thy deeds. What committed? Heaven stops the nose at it, and the moon winks, the body wind kisses that. All it meets is hushed within the hollow mine of earth and will not hear it. What committed? Impudent strumpet! By heaven, you do me wrong! 
Are you not a strumpet? No, as I am a Christian. If to preserve this vessel for my lord from any other foul, unlawful touch be not to be a strumpet, I am none. What? Not a whore? No, as I shall be saved. Is it possible? Oh, heaven forgive us. I cry you mercy, then. I took you for the cunning whore of Venice that married with Othello. <sighs> you, mistress! that have the office opposite to St. Peter, and keep the gate of hell. You, you, ay, you, we have done our course. There's money for your pains. I pray you, turn the key and keep our counsel. Alas, what does this gentleman conceive? How do you, madam? How do you, my good lady? Faith half asleep. Good madam, what's the matter with my lord? With who? With my lord, madam. Who is thy lord? He that is yours, sweet lady. I have none. Do not talk to me, Amelia. I cannot weep, nor answer have I none, but that should go by water. Prithee tonight. Lay on my bed my wedding sheets. Remember, and call my husband hither. There's a change indeed. Tis meet I should be used so very meet. How have I been behaved that he might stick the smallest opinion on my least misuse? What is your pleasure, madam? How is it with you? Uh, I cannot tell. Those that do teach young babes do it with gentle means and easy tasks. He might have chid me so, for in good faith, I am a child to chiding. What's the matter, lady? Alas, Iago, my lord hath so behorthed her. Thrown such despite and heavy terms upon her as true hearts cannot bear. Am I that name, Iago? What name, fair lady? Such as... She says my lord did say I yes, I was. He called her whore. A beggar in his drink could not have laid such terms upon his callet. Well, why did he so? I will be hanged if some eternal villain, some busy and insinuating rogue, some cogging, cousining slave to get some office hath not devised this slander, I'll be hanged else. Fine. There is no such man. It is impossible. Why should he call her whore? Who keeps her company? What place? What time? What for? What likelihood? The Moor's abused by some most villainous knave, some base, notorious knave, some scurvy fellow. Speak within door. Oh, fie upon them! Some such squire he was that turned your wit to see me side without and made you suspect me with the more. You are a fool. Go to. Oh, good Iago. What shall I do to win my lord again? Good friend, go to him. For by this light of heaven I know not how I lost him. Here I kneel. If e'er my will did trespass against his love, either in discourse of thought or actual deed, or that mine eyes, mine ears, or any sense delighted them in any other form, or that I do not yet and ever did and ever will, though he do shake me off to beggarly divorcement, love him dearly, comfort forswear me. Unkindness may do much, and his unkindness may defeat my life, but never taint my love. I cannot say whore. I pray you, be content. Tis but his humor of the business of the state does him offense, and he does chide with you. If it were no other... Tis but so, I warrant. Go in, and weep not. All things shall be well. How now, Rodrigo? 
I do not find that thou deals justly with me. What in the contrary? Every day thou daffst me with some device, Iago, and rather, as it seems to me now, keeps from me all conveniency than suppliest me with the least advantage of hope. I will indeed no longer endure it, nor am I yet persuaded to put up in peace what already I have foolishly suffered. Will you hear me, Rodrigo? Faith, I have heard too much, for your words and performances are no kin together. You charge me most unjustly. With naught but truth. I have wasted myself out of my means. The jewels you have had for me to deliver to Desdemona would have half corrupted a votarist. You have told me she hath received them and returned me expectations and comforts of sudden respect and acquaintance. But I find none. Well, go to. Very well. Very well. Go to. I cannot go to, man, nor tis not very well. Nay, I think it is scurvy and begin to find myself fobbed in it. Very well. I tell you, tis not very well. I will make myself known to Desdemona. If she will return me my jewels, I will give over my suit and repent my unlawful solicitation. If not, assure yourself, I will seek satisfaction of you. You have said no. I, and said nothing but what I protest indentment of doing. And now I see there's metal in thee. And even from this instant to build on thee a better opinion than ever before. Give me thy hand, Rodrigo. Thou hast taken against me a most just exception, but yet, I protest, I have dealt most directly in thy affair. It hath not appeared. I grant indeed it hath not appeared, and your suspicion is not without wit and judgment. But, Rodrigo, if thou hast that in thee indeed, which I have greater reason to believe now than ever, I mean purpose. Courage and valor, this night show it. If thou the next night following enjoy not Desdemona, take me from this world with treachery and devise engines for my life. Well, what is it? Is it within reason and compass? Sir, there is a special commission come from Venice to depute Cassio in the fellow's place. Is that true? Why, then Othello and Desdemona return again to Venice. Oh, no. He goes into Maritania and takes away with him the fair Desdemona, unless his abode be lingered here by some accident, wherein none can be so determinate as the removing of Cassio. What do you mean, removing of him? Why, by making him incapable of a fellow's place? Knocking his brains out. And that you would have me to do? Aye, if you dare do yourself a profit and a right. He sups tonight with a harlotry, and thither will I go to him. He knows not yet of his horrible fortune. If you will watch his going hence, which I will fashion to fall out between twelve and one, you may take him at your pleasure. I will be near to second your attempt, and he shall fall between us. Come, stand not amazed at it, but go along with me. I will show you such a necessity in his death that you shall think yourself bound to put it on him. It is now high supper time, and the night grows to waste. About it. I will hear further reason for this. And you shall be satisfied. Beseech you, sir, trouble yourself no further. Oh, pardon me. It will do me good to walk. Madam, good night. I humbly thank your ladyship. Your honor is most welcome. Will you walk, sir? Oh, Desdemona. My lord? 
Get thee to bed on the instant. I will be returned forthwith. Dismiss your attendant there. Look it be done. I will, my lord. How goes it now? He looks gentler than he did. He says he will return incontinent. He hath commanded me to go to bed and bade me to dismiss you. Dismiss me? It was his bidding. Therefore, good Amelia, give me my knightly wearing and adieu. We must not now displease him. I would you had never seen him. So would not I. My love doth so approve him that even his stubbornness, his checks, his frowns, prithee, unpin me, have grace and favor in them. I have laid those sheets you bade me on the bed. All's one. Good faith, how foolish are our minds. If I do die before thee, prithee, shroud me in those same sheets. Come, come, you talk. My mother had a maid called Barbara. She was in love and he she loved proved mad and did forsake her. She had a song of willow, an old thing twas, but it expressed her fortune and she died singing it. That song tonight will not go from my mind. I have much to do but to go hang my head all at one side and sing it like poor Barbara. <laughs> Ready, dispatch. Shall I go fetch your nightgown? No, unpin me here. This Lodovico is a proper man. A very handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks well. <laughs> I know a lady in Venice would have walked barefoot to Palestine for a touch of his nether lip. <laughs> <laughs> The poor soul sat sighing by a sycamore tree, sing all the green willow. Her hand on her bosom, her head on her knee, sing willow, willow, willow. The fresh streams ran by her and murmured her moans, sing willow, willow, willow. Her salt tears fell from her and softened the stone, sing Hark, who is that knocks? It's the wind. So, get thee gone, good night. Mine eyes do itch, to thought but weeping. Tis neither here nor there. I have heard it said so. Oh, these men, these men! Dost thou in good conscience think, tell me, Amelia, that there be women do abuse their husbands in such gross kind? There be some such, no question. Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? Why, would you not? <laughs> no, by this heavenly light. Nor I by this heavenly light. I might do it as well in the dark. Wouldst thou do such a deed for all the world? The world's a huge thing. It is a great prize for a small vice. In truth, I think thou wouldst not. In truth, I think I should, and undo it when I had done. Mary, I would not do such a thing for a joint ring, nor for measures of lawn, nor for gowns, petticoats, nor caps, nor any petty exhibition. <laughs> but for the whole world? Why, who would not make their husband a cuckold to make him a monarch? I should venture purgatory for it. Beshrew me if I would do such a wrong for the whole world. Why, the wrong is but a wrong in the world. And having the world for your labor, tis a wrong in your own world. You might quickly make it right. I do not think there is any such woman. Yes, a dozen and as many to the vantage as would store the world they played for. But I do think it is their husbands' faults if wives do fall. And say they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps. 
or else break out in previous jealousies, throwing restraint upon us, or say they strike us, or scant our former having in despite. Why, we have gulls, and though we have some grace, yet we have some revenge. Let husbands know their wives have sense like them, I mean, they see and smell and have their palates for both sweet and sour as husbands have. What is it that they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is. And doth affection breed it? I think it doth. Is frailty that thus errs? It is so too. And have not we affections desires for sport and frailty as they have, as men have. And let them use us well, or else let them know the ills we do, their ills instruct us so. Good night, good night. Heaven me such uses send, not to pick bad from bad, but by bad mend. What is the matter, Ho? Who is that cried? Who is the cried? Oh, my dear Cassio. My sweet Cassio. Oh, Cassio. Cassio, Cassio. Oh, notable strumpet. Bass, what's the matter? What's the matter, husband? Cassio hath been set on in the dark by Rodrigo and fellows that escaped. He's almost slain and Rodrigo dead. Alas. Good gentlemen, alas, good Cassio! I do suspect this trash to be a party in this injury. This is the fruit of whoring. Pretty Amelia, go know of Cassio where he supped tonight. What? Do you shake at that? He supped at my house, but I therefore shake not. Oh, did he so? I charge you, go with me. Fie! Fie upon thee, strumpet! I am no strumpet, but of life as honest as you that thus abuse me. As I? Oh, fie upon thee. Come, mistress, you must tell another tale. Amelia, run you to the citadel and tell my lord and lady what hath hat. Will you go on? I pray. This is the night that either makes me or fordoes me quite. It is the cause. It is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. Nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die, else she'll betray more men. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me but once put out thy light. Thou cunningst pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume. When I have plucked the rose, I cannot give it vital growth again. It must needs wither. I'll smell it on the tree. Oh, balmy breath that dost almost persuade justice to break her sword. One more. One more.
be thus when thou art dead. And I will kill thee and love thee after, one more and this the last. So sweet was ne'er so fatal, I must weep. But they are cruel tears, this sorrow's heavenly. It strikes where it doth love. She wakes. Who's there? Othello? I, Desdemona. Will you come to bed, my lord? Have you prayed tonight, Desdemona? I, my lord. If you bethink yourself of any crime unreconciled as yet to heaven and grace, solicit for it straight. Alas, my lord, what do you mean by that? Well, do it, and be brief. I will walk by. I would not kill thy unprepared spirit. No, heaven forfend. I would not kill thy soul. Talk you of killing? Ay, I do. And heaven have mercy on me. Amen, with all my heart. If you say so, I hope you will not kill me. Mm. And yet I fear you, for you are fatal when your eyes roll so. Why I should fear I know not, since guiltless I know not, but yet I feel I fear. Think on thy sins. They are loves I bear to you. Ay, and for that thou diest. That death's unnatural that kills for loving. Peace and be still. I will so. What's the matter? That handkerchief which I so loved and gave thee, thou gavest to Cassio. No, by my life and soul, send for the man and ask him. Sweet soul, take heed. Take heed of perjury, thou art on thy deathbed. Ay, but not yet to die. Yes, presently. Therefore confess thee freely of thy sin, for to deny each article with oath cannot remove nor choke the strong conception that I do groan with all. Thou art to die. The Lord have mercy on me. I say amen. And have you mercy too? I never did offend you in my life. Never loved Cassio, but with such a general warranty of heaven as I might love. Never gave him token. By heaven I saw the handkerchief in his hand. Yo, oh, perjured woman! Thou dost stone my heart and makes me call what I intend to do a murder, which I thought a sacrifice. I saw the handkerchief. He found it. Then I never gave it him. Send for him hither. Let him confess a truth. He hath confessed. What, my lord? That he hath used thee. How? Unlawfully. Aye. He will not say so. No. His mouth is stopped. Honest Iago hath ta'en order for it. Oh, my fear interprets. What, is he dead? Had all his hairs been lives, my great revenge had stomach for them all. Alas, he is betrayed, and I undone. Out, strumpet, weeps thou for him to my face? Oh, banish me, my lord, but kill me not. Down, strumpet! Kill me tomorrow, let me live tonight. If you strive! But half an hour. Being done, there is no pause. But while I say one prayer. It is too late! <sighs> no more moving. Still is the grave. I think she stirs again. <laughs> no. My wife. My wife. What wife? I have no wife. Oh, insupportable. Oh, heavy hour. Methinks it should be now a huge eclipse of sun and moon, and that the affrighted globe should yawn at alteration.
Hello, everyone. My name is Tyrone Mitchell Henderson, and I had the pleasure of participating in the Othello Project. 30 years ago, I played the role of Othello at the Dallas Shakespeare Festival, and it was my first experience playing one of Shakespeare's pivotal roles. While working on the handkerchief edit of Othello, virtually, it brought to light the urgency of the play and the intensity and swiftness within which Iago's mischievous actions captures Othello's jealous mind and heart. Additionally, specifically during this time of unrest and racial discrimination, one line vibrated truer for me than ever before. While I consider Shakespeare one of the foremost playwrights, he's amazing and he was a white man. And for Othello, he wrote, happily for I am black and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have, or for I am declined into the veil of years, yet that's not much. She's gone, I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. It oddly rings in my ear, echoes and vibrates within the context of America's disjointed gaze at black men. So, I want to thank Christopher Scott, this amazing cast, and Baruch College for engaging us all in the classical texts, even though we were all in these little video boxes. I hope that the words still ring true. Hi guys, I'm Therese Barbado and I read Desdemona in our Othello and was very delighted to do so. I would say that working on Shakespeare in the virtual medium did two things for me. One was, you know, I haven't read or performed any Shakespeare this whole pandemic. And I had a kind of delightful surprise in reading it and feeling some release because the language is so epic and large. And what we're living through right now is so epic and so large. And I felt like, oh, wow, this language is meant for a time like this. And so that was a really wonderful experience of feeling like the language matched the moment, like this pandemic moment. Um, but, you know, the counter to that is that I think we all felt as we got excited and were interacting and making these scenes happen, this sort of leaning in, you know, and a desire to just be together, this longing, I think we all felt like a real profound longing. And that was a good reminder too, you know, that we're doing what we can and we're storytelling how we can, but there's just no substitute for being in space with other bodies. And I think it's okay just to, to know that, you know, that you can't, you can't approximate theater and um, that hunger that's in all of us will hopefully find a really good voice or use once we're out of this. Um, and the other thing I would say about working on Desdemona that was really fun is just that, you know, Desdemona, you know, there's a lot in the play about things about her, but she's actually privy to almost none of it. And so my experience was almost an unlearning. I'm reading this whole play, so I know exactly what's going on, but Desdemona doesn't hear anything that happens between Othello and Iago, doesn't hear anything about Amelia and Iago, um, the stuff that's happening with Bianca. I mean, she's privy to none of it. And so it reminded me as a person, you always sort of hope for the best. You know, if, some, if things seem off, you're sort of like, is everything okay? You know, but you would never actually anticipate how bad things are. So it was like a unlearning in a sense of not giving Desdemona any more information than she has, which actually keeps her really kind of positive and naive and not knowing. And it allows for a lot more discovery as things get worse and worse and worse and worse, but to not, to not know it, to not anticipate it. And that's just like a very particular acting challenge that was fun um, to embody even in our very short process. Oh, Brittany Simpson here. It felt like, it felt like a taste, right? It, uh, like a dessert that you haven't had in a really long time. Maybe a whole meal, like you've just been starving, wandering in the wilderness. Um, <laughs> and it made me yearn for the things that are missing, right? Um, I missed being able to look into um, my other's eyes and deliver lines, but it felt nice to get the words in my mouth again and to even get the, the, the mind churning or, uh, you know, 
dissecting Shakespeare, which I could do in my own time, but it's, you know, it feels like something meant to be done as a collective. Um, so it was a wonderful taste and it was not a whole meal and that's what it felt like. And I'm hungry. <laughs> Connecting to Amelia in this bite-sized amount of time um, was just enough to get me to want to play her. <laughs> um, I, Chris did a really great job at like letting us know like um, that this is a reading. Um, so I think it took the pressure off to perform and I just like got to switch on that play mode for a few days. Um, if anything, it just it just got me acquainted with a character um, that I connected to and didn't realize that I connected to. To get to deliver that speech, I can't wait to just like, it's one that you could chew on for years. So um, I'm looking forward to that. And I don't, this it just, it was the opening of the can, you know, it's like, what's in here? Oh, that's good. I'll have one of those. I'll have one of those, a whole meal. So, yeah. Hey everybody, um, my name is Jean Gillette. And um, I played Iago in the uh, reading that you just saw or getting ready to see. Looking at it from an abbreviated kind of schedule, um, I always have a certain way that I work on Shakespeare. Um, I went, to, my grad school was in classical acting, so um, I had really good training in that kind of aspect. What I do is I break the whole text down um, paraphrase everything. I cheated on this one because we only had a week, so I just went to No Fear Shakespeare, which is a book, um, and it has all the modern translation of the words. But what so I I'll go through and write out all of my paraphrasing myself, <clears throat> excuse me, and then um, go to the OED, which is the Oxford English Dictionary, and look up every word that I don't know. Um, and that's kind of where you really find the treasure in the text because um, like one of our first lessons in school was um, with Michael Kahn, who was the head of the Shakespeare Theater in DC. And he just had us all sit around and um, pick up and get our uh, Penguin Shakespeare and open it up to Hamlet and just start reading. And we got to, I don't remember if it's Bernardo or who, but somebody says, stand and unfold yourself. And he goes, okay, stop. What does stand mean? And so we talked about what does stand mean? And he goes, well, go get the Oxford English Dictionary. And so somebody did and brought it back and you open it up and there's 26 different definitions of the word stand. So that's 26 different ways that you could play just that one word. And it gives you so many options as an actor on how you wanna make a role your own. And how is it doing it by Zoom? I've, I've thought about that a lot and I would imagine it's a bit like it was for the Shakespearean actors um, because they only got this, their sides. They didn't get the whole script. And um, that had to be really daunting. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that they were much more familiar with this, but with us, it was look at the camera, don't look at your scene partner because you want it to, you want it to be like one-on-one -on -one with the audience here. Um, and so much of acting is reacting. And when you're not able to play off of your fellow actors, it can be hard. Um, because you just don't know what they're given to you. But it was such a great cast and such a great group of people. That's kind of, that was my, my abbreviated process on this project. And uh, thank you to Christopher and Lou and everybody. And, and thank you guys for watching it because it's a role I've always wanted to play. And it was fun to get a chance to kind of dig into it. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it and um, have a great rest of the semester. Take care. Hello, I'm Eliza. I played Bianca and Roderigo for The Great Works, Othello Project. How did working on Shakespeare in this virtual platform affect you? Um, uh, Therese, who played Desdemona, um, after we uh, recorded everything, she said it really well. I think the fact that Shakespeare is so heightened and we are living in such heightened times. I think it was like a wonderful opportunity and time to be able to uh, read Shakespeare and perform in it because it matched the the level and magnitude of what we're 
going through right now. Uh, so it was able to, you know, help me move through the feelings that I'm feeling right now and properly like put them in a, uh, theater opportunity and performance opportunity, um, that, that matched how I'm feeling right now. And I think how the world is feeling right now. Um, I think for, uh, playing uh, Bianca and Rodrigo was so much fun for me. I love characters. Um, I love leaning into like physical behavior and um, character work. Um, and like also like in leaning into some comedy, even in tragedy, uh, it's, it's always fun for me to do. So I think it was just trying to have fun. <laughs> um, it was trying to find uh, fun given what the situation was and still behaving truthfully and understanding what the relationship was with the other character. But I think it's just like trying to find some choices that resonated with me and that um, made me find joy uh, in this project. Uh, thank you again for um, watching and uh, taking the time to, you know, have this experience with us because theater is a shared experience live and because we don't get to do that now, um, I think the audience's um, participation is slightly delayed since this was recorded. But anyway, thank you for um, partaking uh, and, uh, and cheers. Thanks so much. Hey everybody, I'm Reynaldo and I play Cassio and Lodovico and I think it was truly an amazing experience working on this Othello during this time because I've been thinking so much about the state of the world we're living in, dealing with race, with gender, with power and Othello is a play that dives into all of those things in really complicated ways and I'm really excited for you to grapple with the problems, the questions that I grappled with in this virtual setting because what I miss so much is being in a room together talking about these things, working through them, and making plays. So I'm excited to hear your feedback, I'm excited to get you thinking, and enjoy.